In 1987, 16-year-old Tiffany Darwish stormed the charts around the world with her second single, I Think We're Alone Now. The single kick-started her career, and decades later it's still the song she's most associated with. One of her best-selling items of merchandise was a t-shirt with the first two words of the song, Children Behave, printed across the front, which she was selling on Instagram and her website as recently as 2019. However, the song was already a top 10 hit, five years before she was born. Tiffany's talents were recognised from a very young age. Supported by her mum Janie and stepfather Dan, she entered talent shows and singing contests. She was eventually discovered by May Boren Axton, who was known in the music industry as the Queen Mother of Nashville. She introduced Elvis Presley to Colonel Parker and co-wrote his first number one, Heartbreak Hotel. May took Tiffany from her home in California to Nashville, where she performed on a local TV station. By the time she was 12, she was already making a name for herself, and some were tipping her to be a future country star. At this time, she was managed by a man named Ron Surrett, who had started looking after her when her parents divorced and her mum went into rehab for alcohol abuse. Ron took Tiffany to a studio to record a demo. The studio was owned by George Tobin, a songwriting producer who had worked with some big names like Smokey Robinson and Kim Carnes. I walked in and, and this music was playing. It was a country thing. And it was obviously her singing it, and uh, it was a really, really powerful voice. He was impressed when he heard her singing, but was suspicious of Ron, as he didn't appear to have any connection to the music industry, and no experience of managing an artist. He gave the lady that had driven Tiffany to the studio his card, and told her that he'd be interested in working with her, if Ron wasn't in the picture. A few months later he got a call to say Ron was gone and before long she was back in the studio. Tobin and Tiffany recorded over 50 demos in various styles. Country, rock, pop, dance, they tried everything. Once they had a selection of songs they were happy with, George and his assistant Brad started approaching all the record labels to try and secure a contract. But they struggled to find anyone interested. No one wanted her. And I'm talking about every record company you could possibly name at that time. I had a gentleman take me by the arm and walk me out and say, you're a nice kid. You know, what are you doing messing around with this teenage stuff? Who cares? Unable to attract any offers based on the recordings alone, Tobin decided to change tactics and convinced MCA to hold an in-person audition. Those in attendance were blown away. It was hard to believe that she was a 15, 16 year old and with such poise and such presentation and such ability, she knocked us all out. She can see all of us, she's singing to all of us, absolutely no inhibitions whatsoever and this remarkable voice coming out of this, this kid. The MCA executives were so impressed, they signed her up on the spot. They released her first single, Danny, with no music video and instead sent her out to clubs to promote it. The problem was she wasn't even old enough to go into these clubs, so the chances of her music getting to her target audience, 12 to 18 year olds, was zero. Tobin and Senior Vice President of MCA, Larry Salters, came up with a plan to take Tiffany to the very heart of the country, to where kids her age spent most of their free time, the mall. I went to sleep one night and woke up in the morning and said, I wonder if I could take Tiffany and put her into malls. It was like a thousand ideas you come up with in the middle of the night, it makes no sense. The mall is where kids were, and that's the audience I was shooting for. And I sat and I went, that's a really good idea, Larry. It seemed right, because I thought, okay, yeah, everyone my age hangs out at the mall. They go shopping. That's perfect. So on June 23rd, 1987, Tiffany kicked off the shopping mall tour at the Bergen Mall in Paramus, New Jersey. She performed three 20 minute sets a day on stages set up outside Cutlery World and Great Expectations. I think I would say, hi, I'm Tiffany. And um, here it is, <laughs> it's on. <laughs> it wasn't an instant success. The first few performances had only two or three people in the audience and the biggest response came from the nearby store owners who complained she was too loud and was scaring away their customers. She started to sing and there was nobody. There were three elderly women 
standing in front of a jewelry store who seemed stunned that anybody was being loud in the mall. And they actually asked us to please turn it down and go away. People walking by just giving us strange looks. You know, what the hell are you doing here? You know, I thought maybe security would come take us away. Despite the initial lack of interest in her, Tiffany persevered with the unorthodox promotional tour. I was definitely rejected a lot of times. Brad tells me I cried a couple of times, but I never said, that's it, they don't like my music, they don't like my voice, I'm gonna quit singing. As the audiences at the mall shows grew, local radio stations began getting requests to play Tiffany songs. In particular, I think we're alone now. But as neither the single nor the album was released at this time, all the stations began calling MCA Records to request copies of Tiffany's music. I'm getting all these phone calls from radio stations in Paramus, Passaic, Rochester, for this Tiffany record, because they're getting requests, they're getting a lot of phones. Radio changed everything. As they started playing I Think We're Alone Now, people started to get familiar with the song. They would also announce sometimes the mall that I was going to be at. With support from radio stations, the show started to attract huge crowds. There was a ton of people there to see me. I mean, you had police and, and people just screaming and yelling and, and so excited to see me. The tour eventually had the desired effect, and on August 29th, 1987, I think we're alone now entered the charts at number 84. By October it had broken into the top 10, and on November 7th it knocked Michael Jackson's bad off the top spot. It stayed at number 1 in the USA for two weeks, and spent three weeks at number 1 in the UK. The music video for the song echoed the promotional tour, and was shot at shopping malls around Utah and the Ball Ring Centre in Birmingham, England. It was filmed and edited by George Tobin, who had now added music video director to his roles as Tiffany's manager and producer. It was Tobin's idea for Tiffany to record the song, an idea she initially hated as she thought the song wasn't modern or hip enough. My producer brought this song in and I was like, what? It was the Tommy James and the Shondells version. And that was, you know, ch ch children behave. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, this is not what I had planned at all. Um, and I didn't really like the song. And I took, he said, well, it's not going to be like this. Wait around a couple hours. I'll do a track and then I'll send you home with it. You come back tomorrow and record it. And when I showed back up to get to the track, I was really again disappointed because it was a dance song and I didn't know if people would be able to tell if I could sing. I knew it was good but I wanted something that was going to show that I could sing, that I was a rocker um, and that I was a real musician even though I was 14. I had this passion about me that I knew that that was like my life's calling. So you know I really didn't want to record this song and I would, took it home and I was just like oh I don't really want to record this. My girlfriends came over and we were doing homework and of course I put my tracks on just to kind of learn them a little bit. And all the girls start moving around and dancing and it made them happy. And there was something about that that I, it made an impression on me. So even though as a vocalist I was like, mm, and as a performer or as an artist I was like, well it's not really what I thought we would start out with. But there's a good vibe here and I went in and recorded it. Um, and had fun recording it that day. The follow-up single, Could Have Been, also went to number one, as did the self-titled album, replacing George Michael's Faith at the top of the charts. The album was certified quadruple platinum on April 5th, 1988. At just 16, she was the youngest female artist to have a number one album in the USA, and the youngest to have two consecutive number one singles. Despite other hits on the same album, and the nine albums that followed, I think We're Alone Now remains her signature song, but it was also a hit 20 years earlier for Tommy James and the Shondells. Their original recording reached number five in the USA back in 1967. Made up of school friends, they began as the Echoes in 1959 before changing their name to Tom and the Tornadoes and then eventually settling on Tommy James and the Shondells. The band signed a recording deal with a local record label while still in high school and released a few singles before disbanding after graduation. Unknown to Tommy James, one of the singles they had released, Hanky Panky, had been discovered by a promoter in Pittsburgh who'd been playing the song as an exclusive. The record just died, and so I graduated from high school in 65 and took my band on the road, and we'd more or less forgotten about it. 
And I was home one weekend unexpectedly in uh, early 66 and got a call from Pittsburgh that uh, a local disc jockey in Pittsburgh had played the record. The switchboard lit up. Uh, somebody had bootlegged 80,000 records, sold them in 10 days, and we were currently number one. My baby does a hanky pain. He wasn't able to get any of the original lineup, so he recruited a band that was playing at the Thunderbird Lounge in Greensburg called the Raconteurs as the new Chandelles. I went to Pittsburgh uh, and uh, picked up the first bar band I could find. They were called the Raconteurs and they were very, very talented and they became the Chandelles. He then went to New York to try and secure a record deal with nationwide distribution. He went to all the big labels like RCA, Columbia and Atlantic. And the last meeting of the day was with a label called Roulette. Roulette Records was run by Morris Levy, the co-founder of the legendary Birdland Jazz Club and a music businessman with connections to the mob. Something he denied. There is no connection between the mob and the music business. He continued to deny it right up until the late 1980s when he was convicted of racketeering following a four-year investigation by the FBI into his connection to the mob. After initially getting positive responses and contract offers from all the labels, they all one by one withdrew their offers. The next day, one by one, all the companies called up and said, uh, listen, we got to pass. Um, it was, what do you mean? We had a deal. Said, no, no, no. We... Jerry Wexler finally from Atlantic uh, admitted what had happened, and that is that uh, uh, Morris Levy from Roulette Records had called all the other record companies and said, this is my record. <laughs> So we were apparently going to be on roulette records, and uh, we were. With no other options left, Tommy James sold the master recording of Hanky Panky to Roulette Records, and with national promotion, the single hit the number one spot. They were initially unaware of the label's link to organised crime. But as events unfolded, they soon came to learn the truth. We learned incrementally is that Roulette, in addition to being a functioning record label, and a good one, was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. It was at Roulette Records they met Richie Cordell, one of the staff songwriters at the label, who began providing songs for the group. Late in December 1966, he gave the band I Think We're Alone Now, and Tommy James immediately identified it as a potential hit record. He didn't waste any time, and the track was recorded on Christmas Eve and released on January the 5th, 1967. I Think We're Alone Now was recorded Christmas Eve, uh, 1966, and it really was a great present. It reached number four and stayed in the charts for 17 weeks. They followed I Think We're Alone Now with another Cordell composition, Moni Moni. That went to number three in the US and number one in the UK. And coincidentally, it was a Billy Idol cover of Moni Moni that knocked Tiffany's cover of I Think We're Alone Now off the top of the charts in 1987. I thought uh, both Billy and Tiffany did a great job of that. They kept them young, and so uh, uh, when they both went number one back to back, that was. Uh, and neither artist knew the other one was coming out with the record, so it was really uh, hmm. that's the first time that had ever happened. Despite recording a number of hits for Roulette Records, Tommy James and the Shondells weren't paid the royalties that were due to them. I realized soon on that uh, we just weren't going to get our money, and wow. anybody who tried was going to be, uh, well, you know what happened to Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy Rogers, right. who was also a roulette artist, was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. left for dead on an L.A. freeway when he went after his royalties. And um, uh, this, you know, we were rubbing shoulders with some very scary people. Tommy is referring to an incident in 1967 when Jimmy Rogers was found unconscious with severe head wounds. The three assailants were later identified as LAPD officers, but nobody was charged with a crime. The official record makes no connection between the assault and roulette records, but Tommy James is convinced Morris Levy ordered the attack. Whether or not you believe his conclusion, it's well documented that roulette records rarely, if ever, paid artists correctly. Levy was also known to give himself writing credits in order to take a share of the publishing revenue. It wasn't until he sold the company shortly after his conviction did anybody get paid in full for the records they released on the label. I Think We're Alone Now was also covered in 1978 by new wave artist Lena Lovitch. It was on hearing her version of the song that Stiff Records boss Dave Robinson signed her to his label and released the track as a single with a hastily written and recorded B-side, Lucky Number. The single did pretty well, 
but most of the attention was directed to the B-side, which was eventually released as an A-side, and that reached number three in the UK and became her signature song. In 2006, Girls Aloud also released a version of I Think We're Alone Now. The recording was rushed in order to be released in time for Christmas, and although it made the top ten, it didn't go down well with most music critics, who described it as cheap and pointless, and made unfavourable comparisons to the Tiffany single, showing that despite not being the original version, or the only cover, her recording remains the most iconic. Now what do you think? Which version is best? Let me know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe to get all the latest videos. And if you want to support the channel, there's now a number of ways you can do that. You can use the thanks button under each video to send a tip, or you can grab something from the merch shelf or store tab. There's t-shirts, hoodies, tote bags and cushions, all in a variety of sizes and colours. All profits go towards making new content and running this channel.